Um, hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be here today talking about literally my favorite subject. Um, so we're, we're going to talk through a couple different things. Um, thank you. That was such a nice introduction. I'll just quickly um, hop through this. Mostly why I got interested in the vulnerability management space. So I was in IT ops for many years, probably more 10, 11 years. Uh, before I got into the cybersecurity space. So I was doing everything from managing infrastructure to managing deployments and development spaces. And what I saw from that side was like vulnerability management was really tough. You know, we've, we've got operations, we've got a million other things that we have to do all the time. And you also want me to remediate every vulnerability that exists. That's really tough. Uh, it's really challenging. Um, I come from the government contracting space, uh, so I'm used to having you know, federal requirements and regulations. Uh, the last uh, three and a half years, I've been at IBM in the private sector space, and so I've had a chance to see kind of what vulnerability management looks like from both sides. So it's been interesting to sort of uh, get a look at, at big picture vulnerability management. Uh, and as mentioned, I did, uh, I'm a glutton for punishment. I wrote two dissertations on vulnerability chaining, I guess just for fun. Uh, no, but I found that you know, there weren't a lot of people talking about vulnerability chaining. We're going to talk a little bit about that today uh, and what that really means to helping to build effective vulnerability management uh, practices. Okay, so quickly, um, I like to talk about, you know, sort of the problem space, kind of where we're at now and the things that I see day to day as a practitioner and the work that I do. So now I, I, I do security architecture and design. So building things from the ground up, but I also do incident response, which means that if I come into a situation and an environment needs to be rebuilt, I'll build it from scratch or help implement security, whatever that might be, uh, whatever that looks like. So uh, seeing security at lots of different levels has sort of given me a, a good perspective on how we can try to do this and some of the common challenges that I see across different teams. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about kind of what the modern DevSecOps pipeline looks like, a little bit about secure by design. Um, and then talk a little bit about a maturity model. So hopefully give you all some practical things to take away and uh, do uh, over time, because it, it can be challenging. OK. So some of the current challenges, some of the things that I see, these are some of the things I see day to day in talking to other uh, practitioners, whether that's developers, engineers, uh, system architects, uh, solutions architects, uh, people that I work with. Um, one of the things we see in the vulnerability management space is that the number of vulnerabilities that are being disclosed over time is just growing. Uh, I believe the last numbers I saw from last year were 55 vulnerabilities released per day. Um, and if you're not as familiar, you may have all been aware or have heard about some of the challenges with NVD and getting vulnerabilities through the system, getting them scored, getting them cataloged properly, uh, which sort of compounds the work that we're seeing uh, in the vulnerability management space. We're also seeing because the CVSS, the Common Vulnerability Scoring System, that we use as our, you know, really our base foundation for how we score vulnerabilities, uh, most of us, or I've seen a lot of people, you know, we leverage other tools to help us understand those vulnerabilities better, uh, something like EPSS, the Exploit Predictability Scoring System. Um, maybe there's a, uh, a different threat scoring system that you're using from your favorite tool to help you sort of supplement that. Uh, but CVSS is really where those initial scores come from. And what we're seeing is that as the CVSS scoring changes over time, uh, you know, we were at 3, 3.1, and now we're at 4. Um, those metrics change the way we look at vulnerabilities. Uh, and so depending on which version you're looking at, it may catalog vulnerabilities either from a high to a critical or even a high down to a medium. So something that may have been classified as a high a year ago if you were using 3.1 might be a, seen as a medium now based on the new scoring system. So this is all just to highlight sort of <laughs> some of the challenges we see in this space. Um, when it comes to scoring systems and how do we contextualize that information for us. Because at the end of the day, vulnerability management is going to be pretty unique depending on your size, your architecture, the applications that you're using, if you have legacy applications, which I'll touch on a little bit more. Um, but I see pretty commonly, mostly because we have so many vulnerabilities to tackle on any given day, that there's a very, very small focus on low and medium vulnerabilities, especially at scale. Uh, when you have so many criticals and highs that you have to constantly be you know, looking at and trying to remediate all the time, uh, it gets really difficult to figure out, well, how, oh, I don't have time to do the lows and mediums. And I know that I've got timelines for criticals and highs. Maybe my mediums and lows are 90 days. Maybe I can get away with 120 days. Maybe that turns into 365 days. Uh, so you know, the, the, they don't get as much time because we've got other stuff to do, right? That's all on top of just trying to build and do our daily jobs. Uh, so 
my point being, it can be really challenging to even get a chance to look at what those vulnerabilities mean when we're trying to remediate all the criticals and highs. Um, I also see, because we use so much open source software, right, we have to. Um, we use it to supplement um, the work that we're doing. We use it because it's really convenient and great and has a lot of great applicability, right? Um, but it can be challenging if you're looking at infrastructure and application development uh, combined. I, I see those usually seen as two different things, not always, um, but sometimes we look at open source software and remediation differently than we do infrastructure, containers, API security, all of that. We sort of look at it in, in different spaces. Um, and so I see that sort of compounding some of the challenges we have. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about roles and responsibilities too, because I see that also being really challenging uh, when it's sort of like, well, hey, I thought you were gonna patch that. And they're like, no, hey, I thought you were gonna patch that. That's not my job, that's your job. Um, and so sometimes I'll find that vulnerabilities don't get fixed because people are, you know, they're like, hey, I thought you were gonna do that, okay. Um, so sometimes roles and responsibilities can be part of those current challenges that we see. Okay, literally my favorite topic. Uh, who here is familiar with vulnerability chaining? Anyone? I got a couple? Okay, great. Um, so vulnerability chaining, by definition, per the CVSS, is the combination of vulnerabilities to create a more severe attack, a critical attack. Typically, we're talking about low and medium vulnerabilities, or vulnerabilities that are scored as low and medium. That means that while we're you know, really busy trying to fix those critical and high vulnerabilities, we could be missing those lows and mediums that could be part of a vulnerability chain that which could lead to privilege escalation, uh, account compromise, you know, you name it. Uh, so looking at vulnerabilities as single entities uh, makes it more challenging to determine where those vulnerability chains exist. Um, you know, pick your scanning tool, your security scanning tool, or your reporting. Uh, sometimes that's reporting, right? We see a list of vulnerabilities and it's like, oh my gosh, okay, I get it. I've got 10,000 vulnerabilities, I need to kind of fix them. But we don't look at them as how they're combined on systems and not just on a singular, singular system, but systems that are connected. And that's where I see some of the challenge coming in with uh, remediation. Um, every time, so I'm, you know, blue teamer, I'm on the blue side, right? I'm trying to fix things. Every time I talk to red teamers about this, because there's a very, the amount of information that's out there about vulnerability chaining is pretty small. We, d we are seeing more vendors come out with vulnerability uh, chained um, disclosures, uh, marking two vulnerabilities together as part of their disclosure um, and talking about how one can be used together, but that's within one product or maybe one application or maybe one OS layer. We're not talking about system-wide, right? Or how vulnerabilities across multiple applications could be used together. So that's where I see the challenge. Um, and it also takes a, a, a lot of time to try to figure this out in your own environment, right? If you're constantly trying to take the time to do remediation, it can be really challenging to say, okay, let me set aside a couple of weeks and figure out what all these vulnerabilities actually mean together, right? Okay, yeah, I have an SSL vulnerability. What does that mean? It's scored as a low. Is that really gonna impact me or not? Is that really gonna be a hop that somebody could make from there to somewhere else? And now I need to try to figure that out. Um, and when I talk about vulnerability chaining, I hear people say, oh yeah, the software supply chain. And I'm like, yes, that's definitely part of it, right? You can use vulnerabilities across multiple applications, right? But I'm also talking about infrastructure and how the applications and infrastructure work together and how those vulnerabilities could lead from one to the other. Uh, so anyway, so I see this being um, a, a bigger challenge that we have to try to solve. And when I was saying vulnerability chaining, we see as two different things. Uh, what I really mean is, Vulnerability chaining as defined by CVSS is, okay, uh, mediums and low vulnerabilities used together, uh, but then we have vendors that are coming out and say our two vulnerabilities are chained together and can create this critical attack. So I think there's still some, um, you know, on the, using my academic side of the brain, I think we still need some better terminology and definition around how we use the term vulnerability chaining um, to help really describe this phenomenon um, that we're seeing. So uh, there is some, I'm seeing more research coming out now in the last year or so, um, even the last couple of years, but even five years ago, this wasn't a topic that we were really talking about, and even when it comes to remediation. You know, I hear about more on the red teaming side versus the, the blue team side. Okay, um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about um, some of the challenges that we see in cloud security architecture, uh, specifically when it comes to vulnerability management. 
one of the things when I'm talking to people about vulnerability management, they're like, oh yeah, CVE IDs. Yes, absolutely, those are vulnerabilities that are classified and have a CVE ID and are part of the NVD, but we're also talking about things that don't necessarily have a CVE ID, not things that are submitted to the NVD for you know, disclosure or for uh, scoring. We're also talking about identity and access management. There's a lot of challenges around overly permissioned accounts or um, how do you actually manage those accounts over time, right? Are we making sure that uh, people don't have access to things that they shouldn't over time? Those aren't necessarily gonna be CVE IDs. Those may be uh, assessments that we do outside of that, but if we're trying to look at what vulnerability chaining might occur in our environment, we have to also account for uh, things that don't necessarily have a CVE ID, but account for vulnerabilities in our environment. Uh, container API security. So I talk about API sprawl a lot, because I see this a lot, where um, everyone's like, oh yeah, we'll just get, yeah, I just need an API key for that. And then you've got hundreds of API keys, and I'm like, well, who's managing these? What's, are they, do they have expiration dates? Who manages them and how are they managed? How do we know when they, like, are we managing if they get expired or, or do they still exist? Who has access to them? Uh, some of those things that they're not gonna have a CVE ID, but something I know I wanna account for if I'm looking at uh, vulnerability management for the entire infrastructure. Uh, Multi-cloud networking. Uh, I see this a lot too if you're working in multiple cloud spaces. If you have a large development environment or if you have maybe HA requirements or you're thinking about BCDR, you might have you know, something in Azure and something in AWS. Um, maybe it's mirrored, maybe it's not. Maybe you're using one for data storage. Maybe one is you know, an active development environment. Whatever the setup might be, uh, I think about how are these clouds uh, environments connected? What networking do we have between them? What kind of integrations do we have between them? Who has access to that? Who manages that? Who monitors that? Um, is, are those things that we're actively counting when we're looking at our vulnerability management program? Uh, so I count network uh, configuration as a part of vulnerability management, again, even though they don't necessarily have a CVE ID um, or a CVSS score. Uh, and then legacy applications and functionality. You know, this is one of the things I see too that when, um, if, if environments were lifted and shifted into the cloud, that they brought legacy applications and software with them. Uh, might have been part of the, hey, we've got you know, six weeks to do this. We've got to get out of our data center and get in the cloud. Just pick it up and put it in the cloud, which brings you know, some security challenges with it. So when that happens, you've then maybe got multi-cloud environments with legacy applications or legacy software that you're also trying to manage and build security around, you know, because maybe you can't remediate that today. Maybe you can't update um, Java for some reason. Maybe you can't update some library for some reason. So how do you sort of build mitigating controls around that? And that gets into the vulnerability management being something where you, know, you have to remediate every vulnerability. It's, you know, it's not always about that. Sometimes it's about, hey, um, you know, I've got to keep this environment in place for six months. How do I secure it until I can get rid of it? Um, which is part of the vulnerability management, I think, challenge. So I'll quickly touch on secure by design. This is absolutely something that's been, I'm sure everyone's uh, well aware of this. This is something that's been going around this term, secure by design, secure by default. But I think the secure by design is not just about, hey, how do we make sure that you know, we're not using default usernames and passwords in our applications and things like that and secrets management. But I think we're also talking about a secure by design mindset because especially from the security architecture standpoint, if I'm coming into an environment they're not gonna be building things from scratch. They're not gonna say, hey, I'm building from secure, uh, secure by default today. Usually it's, hey, I've got an environment that exists today. How can I take that mindset of, you know, I really shouldn't be doing these practices or I should really find a way to kind of get away from this. So bringing that mindset into environments that currently exist, not just saying, well, I'm building a new product, I should probably do this. Um, so secrets management being one of the biggest things I know I've, in the last year or so, uh, we've seen a number of different attacks um, specifically around secrets management um, and identity and access management, so protecting our accounts. Um, and what I see commonly is, you know, we've kind of gotten ourselves into this place where we have environments where we've got to figure out, okay, how do I secure this today? Not just what did we do yesterday, but okay, let's take a look at how this environment exists today. Um, creating secure baselines. This is not always a thing that you can do. That's a thing you can do with secure by design, right? You can say, I'm gonna use a secure um, image, I'm gonna build containers from that, and I'm gonna run my containers from my secure image. Okay, great. 
It's not always possible to do that if you have an environment that's running. For new systems that you bring online, you can absolutely do that. And so my recommendation for people is if you have systems running and you're like, okay, I have a new secure baseline and I kind of, you know, if I build new systems, I can build from that, but how do I secure my current environment? Usually what I say is take, um, like if we were talking about CIS benchmarks, right? Let's say there's 100 controls that you would put in place for a secure baseline. My recommendation for people is always take them 10 controls at a time and go, you know, build them into your images and kind of see what happens in your dev test environments first. Uh, you don't have to do 100 controls all at once just to try to get to that secure baseline. You can take that maturity model approach and implement slowly to make sure that you don't impact functionality. You know, because at the end of the day, we have to really balance security and building these secure baselines with, I have an environment I need to keep running and I have SLAs and I have customers and, you know, I need to make sure the systems are secure, um, but not bringing them down. Uh, one of the other things I see that I wanted to bring up when we're talking about secure by design is... Um, ports and networking. I see a lot of, in uh, cloud environments and in multi-cloud environments, you know, we, we open up a lot of uh, ports or we just say, eh, maybe I'll lock down a couple. I'm gonna leave the rest open because this application uses this port and this one uses this port. So it's too complicated networking, I'm just gonna keep it open. And I find that being a really, uh, really big challenge, especially when you're coming into an environment and trying to determine where your gaps might be when it comes to vulnerability management. And so I'd love to bring networking into the conversation to say, hey, this might be a good way that you can kind of lock down your environment, especially if you're trying to mitigate vulnerabilities from older legacy applications and you can't really get rid of them today. Networking, segmentation, all of those things are possible to help at least get those environments secure uh, until you can get to a place where you can get to like full stack remediation. Okay, this is where I'm gonna spend the most time. Uh, this is, these are a few things, again, that you can sort of uh, take with you and, and build with you over time, and I am gonna leave um, some time for questions, too. Uh, but when it comes to effective vulnerability management, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about human factors, too. What I find is that it's, it, it's sort of giving yourself the space to say, okay, I need to take a week off of just trying to fix every vulnerability and figure out what I've got. Um, really do a, a deep dive, a discussion, bring in the proper team members and figure out what we need to do first. Um, usually that includes an inventory of some sort, evaluating the inventory, what do you have today, what do you have eyes on, uh, what kind of visibility do you have, are we missing things? That's uh, the biggest part of the conversation because if you're not accurately seeing everything in your security scanning or your vulnerability scanning, uh, then it's gonna be really difficult to get a good picture of what's going on and that includes software scanning too. Uh, so getting a good idea of what we've got, because then you can build a plan from there. Uh, until that's done, it could be really challenging to figure out, because if you, if you implement that uh, picture over time, you're constantly gonna be fighting that fire of, oop, we found something new, we've gotta fix that. Oop, we found something new, we gotta fix that, instead of trying to get a really good groundwork for what you've got in front of you. Uh, vulnerability and risk review. So this is where I'm gonna start talking about human factors a little bit. One of the things I see, um, and one of the reasons why I like to bring the human factors element into cybersecurity and what we do in vulnerability management is that uh, scenario I was talking about where people sort of are like, oh, I thought you were gonna do this, I thought you were gonna do that. When it comes to us working together, uh, sometimes I'll see teams that are like, well, you know, having a challenge working with some team or you know, maybe historically they've had a tough time working with them. Uh, that can make vulnerability management and remediation really tough. Uh, it can make it a lot more difficult if you have friction between teams or teams that are you know, saying, hey, that's their job, that's not my job. Uh, so I find that sometimes uh, bringing in that, when we're talking about a vulnerability and risk review, it's also a team review. Who should be involved in this? Who should have a voice? Who should come in and tell us what's actually gonna affect production, right? Um, my favorite uh, example of this is, uh, so when I was in IT operations, I was the one that was the system owner, right? So this is my system, I own the risk, I manage the vulnerabilities. And then having the security team come to me and send me a vulnerability report and they're like, here's all your vulnerabilities. And I'm like, yeah, 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 I got it, trust me, I know, I gotta fix these. Um, and sitting in you know, four hour long meetings going over security assessments, and I would have other IT members say like, man, you know, it's really frustrating working with security. 
it's really tough. Like they throw us all these vulnerabilities and I don't know how to fix them and I'm not really sure and I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And then I got to the security side and trying to talk to IT operations and developers and finding that you know, security professionals are frustrated too. They're like, I wanna help or I wanna do this or I wanna do that. And I was like, you know, sometimes it's about changing the conversation, right? Um, so I, I, the reason I bring in like psychology a little bit into this is it's like when I do a vulnerability and risk review, for me, it's to go in, bring in the right people and listen to them. What challenges are they having? What are they trying to fix? What are they trying to do? What failed, right? Like what didn't work? So how, we can, how can we figure out how to go forward from there? So okay, we know that didn't work. So me sending you a spreadsheet of 10,000 vulnerabilities on a Friday at five o'clock might not work. Uh, because then you're gonna be mad at me, <laughs> and then we're gonna have a tough time working together next week, right? So I think taking into account all of those things and figuring out how we work together uh, to get these things done can, can be sometimes the biggest thing to move the needle, uh, to really be the thing to move us forward. Uh, after that, proper reporting and RACI. I cannot name the times that I have seen a vulnerability report that's just a spreadsheet of 10,000 vulnerabilities or 20,000 or you know, pick your poison. That to me is not helpful data, right? If I'm an application owner or I'm a developer, it's not easy for me to get an idea of what I need to focus on first. Yeah, I can see we have this critical high, medium low, okay, great. What does that mean to me? So what I've found from the security engineering and architecture side is if we sit down together and talk through the infrastructure or the actual application itself, then we can start to build a remediation picture or pick your top three that have to be fixed, not fix everything today right, or you've got 30 days. But what do you need to focus on first so that we can get to that place? So part of that vulnerability and risk review, and by the way, I know we have regulations, we have to do things in a th certain amount of time, I understand that, like 30 days to fix you know, highs or whatever, but my point being, if you can help come together as, as teams, you can start to build that picture for what you can actually accomplish over time and stop the you know, fighting the vulnerability fire over time and help get to a place where you can build in, one, some automation, hopefully, um, so that you don't have to keep doing this manual review. Uh, but two, hopefully, you can get to a place where you know, you're not constantly running these fire drills every time, and then you only have to do it for zero days, right? Um, which is great, not really. Um, uh, and then vulnerability chaining. To me, that's you're getting closer to the higher peak of vulnerability management maturity, because that's not something that's easy to implement day one, right? That's a, that's a hard thing, right? Especially if you're in a place where you're kind of in the trenches with vulnerability management and you're not really, you know, you're trying to dig yourself out. Uh, that to me is a longer tail. That's something you can build in over time. But once you get to a place where you say, hey, um, I want to take a look at more system context and how these vulnerabilities interact together, then you can start to target even more vulnerabilities that make more sense. So once you've got your sort of normal cadence of remediation, uh, then you can start to say, Okay, there's this low medium or there's this low vulnerability that's been hanging out. I see that it's highly exploitable. I'm not entirely sure why it scored as low, but it is. Uh, let me see what this means to me. Then you can dig in and spend the time on specific vulnerabilities and uh, spend those times fixing lows and mediums. To give you an example, so I was uh, doing vulnerability reporting and uh, talking about why vulnerability chaining was important. Um, one of my executives, this was many years ago, said, um, yeah, I don't care about that. I don't care about lows and mediums. I said, okay, uh, let me change the way I interpret this data. So what I did was I changed my reporting to highly exploitable vulnerabilities and actively exploited vulnerabilities because when I changed that report, lows and mediums started showing up on that report. And some of them were pretty high on that report. And it was like, wait, they're highly exploitable, how? And then we started to have the conversation of how they could be exploited. Whether an active exploit was available or not, this is how it could be done and be leveraged to get to this other vulnerability. So sometimes changing the data helps you know, to sort of see what the bigger picture is. So anyway, I wanted to provide that example because that was one of the ways that I was able to say, no, vulnerability chaining is important to our vulnerability management program, here's why. Uh, and then human factors review. Again, this is, this is not something that you can really do day one, but I do encourage it. Human factors as a discipline is really about how do we create tools, um, software, applications for the people that use them. To me, that includes security. 
how do I build security into tools and applications that make sense for the people that are gonna use the applications? Um, that includes security practitioners, that includes developers, that includes engineers and system architects and everyone. Um, so I think it's important to get, when you get to that place, to, to go back and say, how are we designing products with security in mind uh, that makes it easier for the people that are consuming those products? That to me is then adding on that extra layer. Um, there's a really good book coming out, I don't know if it's out yet, uh, by Heidi Trost. I believe it's called Human Centered Design. Um, but she's building a, essentially a design book for um, UX and UI designers with security in mind. So how do you build security into uh, the design for your customers and your users? So I know I'm personally excited to read that book. Um, I think it might be out, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, uh, that to me is like getting to that place where you can start to really think, how do I implement security that makes sense for the people that are using it? Uh, okay. I think we're getting close to time. So um, this is the book that I wrote. There is a human factors um, chapter in there and a vulnerability chaining chapter, because um, you know I had to uh, include them. Um, <laughs> but really what I hope you all take away is that it's, it, you know, when it comes to vulnerability management and we're talking about DevSecOps and, and building a really good pipeline, um, Start small, don't feel like you have to tackle everything at once, um, and you can certainly build in those things over time. And depending on where you're already at in your vulnerability management picture, you can still build on there and mature from there.